Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 337, featuring the first in a new series of interviews with Mr. Julian Gollop, the creator of Chaos Reborn and of course XCOM. Now as you know, uh, as you may know anyway, there was a mishap with my recording of this video and I only got the audio, uh, but not the video. Now truth be told, I'd rather have the audio uh, than the video, since, you know, that's the important part. Uh, but anyway, please bear with me. I've done my best to replace the uh, the footage with gameplay and uh, photographs and other things. So hopefully it will still be visually interesting. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Julian Gollop. All right, folks, I am here with the great Julian Gollop. He is the uh, a game designer. He's the CEO of Snapshot Games and the designer of a little game you've probably played called XCOM. How are you today, Julian? I'm 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 absolutely fine. So I thought before we got into the history, and all the stuff you've done back in the '80s, because you've been a you've been part of the industry for I guess going back to the very beginning. But I was wanting to talk a little bit about Chaos uh, Reborn. Sure. A very interesting project was kickstarted successfully, launched, or I guess it went uh, from early access to full access back in October. Uh, yeah, so we launched it in early access December 2014, and it was released uh, on in October last year. So it's a, quote, fast-paced wizard combat with a tactical positioning of chess yes. and the bluffing odds calculation of poker. So we've got kind of <laughs> yes. poker and chess in the same game. Does that seem to be a pretty, yeah. pretty good formula? Um, I think it's a very exciting formula. Yeah, it really works. I mean, it, 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 Case Reborn is very positional. And um, one of the interesting things you have to learn very quickly is that you must keep your wizard out of danger. And a lot of new players complain, you know, I, I keep losing, oh, the game is cheating, the random number is cheating. And I said, well, you look at their game and... Also making some very elementary mistakes. So you have to, um, some players may learn the hard way, but um, it is very much about positioning your wizard, your creatures, and, and getting the um, the best opportunities to maximize your chances um, of having those spells having great effects or those attacks panning out. So yeah, and, it, and the bluff element comes from the um, the fact that you can summon creatures as illusions and you get a hundred percent chance to summon them um but they can be disbelieved by uh, other players using their disbelief spell which is like a permanent spell every wizard has so that element bluff can be pretty exciting and, and again the the good players know how to bluff and they know how to detect bluffs and um you always get a moment of tension in the game and because someone tries to disbelieve they may succeed they may not and uh you know this can this is a big element in the game so yeah poker meets chess the people are complaining about the random numbers cheating what yeah they do yeah 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 oh, there's um they do and um Just sore I, losers <laughs> well it was partly due to basic human psychology that human beings are not very good with random numbers we we tend to think that you know sequences of unusual results, say like when you're flipping a coin and you get five heads in a row, you, you think that you know, randomly this sh should not happen. Of course, this is exactly what random number generators do. That occasionally you get these sequences of similar results. Um, but because of another factor called negativity bias, the players only kind of really remember the the times when this goes against them rather than the times when it works for them because overall over time with lots of random numbers generated of course things balance out negativity bias yes yeah, it's called negativity bias this is a psychological phenomenon you can you can check it out if you want to that learn some more really, yeah interesting i think i might suffer from that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I heard there's a statistics professor here that he'll ask his students uh, to write down a list of random numbers, and then he'll say, "Well, these this is not random because you 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 put too much thought into making the numbers different, right?" Yeah. Whereas really random numbers, there might be four or five ones all in a row. Exactly. Exactly. Well, this was a, this this Kickstarter project for Chaos Reborn was a, I was reading it was a very unusual because you actually had a playable game. 
uh, going yeah. into it, right? Does he think that was a pretty good yes. move, or was that by design? Well, I was working on a playable prototype uh, for quite a while, quite a few months. I had it working multiplayer, and the graphics were very basic. And I hadn't decided whether to, to release that during the Kickstarter, Kickstarter campaign. And I think it was about halfway through I decided to make it public because I thought it might help the Kickstarter campaign if people could play it and get a feel for the gameplay, even though it looked very, very basic. And, um, yeah, it did help enormously because I was able to get some some uh, other game industry celebrities like Ken Levine and Jake Solomon to help me out with a few Let's Play YouTube videos. And I think on the final day of the Kickstarter, we... Um, arranged a match with myself, Ken Levine, uh, and Total Biscuit, who was streaming it on his uh, huge YouTube channel, and and that had quite a big impact on, on the very final day of the campaign. Wow, well, sounded like you did a really successful campaign. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic, yeah. Nerve-wracking for most of it. <laughs> Well, what about the progress on the single player campaign because I understand that was one of the one of the concerns early on yeah so the single player system which is really the core of the role playing game system we um, worked on that after we implemented a lot of the multiplayer systems and we went through several iterations of that so we had some feedback on our initial version that players thought it was too simple so we had to add stuff to it and actually, we've gone through, I think, a couple of major iterations on it now. Um, and now the, the, the Realm Editor, as we call it, which is accessible to players who are of the Wizard King level, which is one of the social ranks in the game, um, are allowed to create realms with um, themselves, their own wizard character as the king, but they can invent elaborate stories and you know conditional branching storylines and everything. So it's quite sophisticated oh, now. Really? So that's is it you're taking a page back from the mud days, I guess, of making wizards and all that. Well, it is kind of um, well. What we wanted to do is some element of user-generated content, um, but also for it to be linked in with the. Um, the social system that we got in the game, and um, I, I'm not sure you can really call it a mud because when you when you're exploring a realm, it's more like um, a series of encounters that you have either with enemy wizards or or these custom encounters that the the um, realm designer can create. Um, I guess you can make it slightly mud-like in some ways, but it, it's really strictly because it's strictly a one use. It's a well, I say it's strictly a single-player experience because you you can actually call in allies to help you in battles, but largely your exploration part is is just you exploring this realm. Well, just a quick question I thought I would ask you, Julian. Just on just personally, your own uh, preference. Do you prefer playing single-player games, or do you like uh, multiplayer games better? I prefer multiplayer games, to be honest. Um, I'm actually a huge board games fan, and board games was my first love, and probably still is my greatest love, I guess, when it comes to gaming. Um, and uh, I, I think that's that's why I like strategy-based multiplayer online games, and I've tried to create those several times in the past. Um, but, of course, my most successful game, which, of course, the original XCOM game, was strictly a single player <laughs> experience. Irony, I guess. But um, I really love to create the single player game experiences. But I guess my personal preference is tending towards the, the player. You know, really, I'm trying to think of some good board games that are single player. It seems like almost all the ones that that are popular anyway. I guess well, Solitaire, if you count that, but... Seems like all the board yeah. games I'm familiar with are the multiplayer. You have to have at least two people, preferably more. Um, no, there are single-player board games, and I think that the first one that I came across was back in 1980, which was in a science fiction magazine called Ares, published by SPI. Um, 
Uh, it's cool. And th they basically had a game in each issue of the magazine. And, and one of the games early issue was called, I think it was Voyage of the Pandora, which was basically a single player exploration game. And it had a, um, like a little programmed paragraph system so that you would do something in the game and it'll tell you to look up this particular paragraph and you had this little booklet with the paragraphs in and it'll give you some story elements and it'll give you some results of what happened and that was uh, that was actually a good example for early single player game. There have been a few s since then though. I read something about a thunderclap tie-in to Chaos Reborn. I had never heard of this thunderclap before. What oh, Thunderclap is, is um, yeah, it's a very simple idea, but it's pretty cool. It means you can get, you can create a Thunderclap campaign, and basically, you uh, write a message that would be sent on people's Twitter feeds um, or Facebook feeds. People then sign up to your Thunderclap campaign, and it will automatically send this message through all of the people's uh, Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds that they that have signed up to the Thunderclap claim, that's giving you a, a sort of like a big bang presence on your uh, social media. That's the idea anyway. So we did it once for the um, Kickstarter campaign. We did it once for the launch of the game. Well, Chaos Reborn, I was uh, surprised at the history of this thing. I mean, this this yeah. it seemed like it goes back to your earliest days, right? You, 1985, we had the first Chaos game, somewhere around in there, right? Yep. Uh, which was based on a board game yep. called uh, Warlock. Uh, well, it wasn't based on Warlock. I was inspired by Warlock to make my own game because I didn't like the way that Warlock was working. So, um, I mean, Warlock was a game published by Games Workshop back in 1980, maybe, something like that, 79, 1980, I can't remember exactly, but um, it was it was very static. You you had wizards tokens on the board, but nothing moved. It was, everything was in the play of cards. So I created my own wizard game, which had cards, and the cards themselves were the pieces that moved around on the board. Yeah, I read somewhere that how how old would you have been at this time? Maybe. Oh, this was nineteen eighty. So sixteen. Sixteen. I just remember reading somewhere where these kids were playing it, and they wouldn't let you play with them. That's right. Yeah. Why yeah. wouldn't they let you play? What was going on with that? Well, I guess they had their own clique. I mean, I it was this was the board games club at school, and uh, this game belonged to one of the kids, and he just played with his friends. So <laughs> I I watched. Them. I watched them play it, and I think that was enough to inspire me to make my own game. Yeah, they must feel pretty, pretty stupid right now, that not not letting you into their gaming click. What the heck? So when you program this game, or somebody else programmed the game, right? You had a friend named Andy Green. Yeah, this was the first version of, um, well, Chaos or the Wizard Games. We called it then. Yes, he programmed it on a BBC Micro computer, Model B. Um, I didn't even have a computer at the time, so this must have been around about 1980 or 1981. I'm not too sure exactly. Yeah, BBC. B. So you eventually did it for the ZX Spectrum, though. Yeah. So when I got my ZX Spectrum, um, I uh, I did uh, I think a couple of games before Chaos, and um, I started on Chaos probably very late 1983. Mostly done throughout 1984. Um, I was I went to college during that year, so I wasn't working on it full time. Um, but eventually, it was published in 1985, and it was the first uh, assembly language program that I'd written, um, which was probably why it took me so long because I had to learn quite a lot to try and get it to work. <laughs> it's a pretty f formidable task. So who uh, was, who was this uh, Andy guy? Was he a friend of yours from school? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, he was um, a friend of mine from school. And actually, later, he came to work with me at Mythos Games. And he worked on um, XCOM Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And the game we made after that, um, which was called Magic and Mayhem. I've got those, all those here. So I was, uh, I was really fascinated by this 
when you're learning assembly language and you I saw where you were describing this process that you used where you basically print out all the source code and yes. go through it line by line. You know, yeah, it sounded like you thought that was a pretty good method that maybe people should use today. Uh, yes, in a way it kind of is used today when you're doing something like pair programming you have another programmer who literally just looks through your code trying to spot any sort of logical flaws or, or errors that you may have missed while writing it which is a very good system but actually yeah printing it out was um, yeah basically I would, I would print out on my little ZX printer which is very sort of thin silver strips of paper and I, I would take these printouts so I can sit down maybe in front of uh, and listen to some music or in front of the TV I would just go through line by line with a pencil um, looking at the execution of the code. <laughs> and some, you did all this with only two micro drives. Yeah, well, the ZX micro drives. Yeah, this was the the compiler was a, was running on one of them. And then it sort of built the code and saved it onto a micro drive on the other micro drive on a cartridge on the other micro drive. It was kind of very very primitive, primitive by today's standards, but it was much faster than cassette tape, which is what was traditionally used as the medium for for uh, loading and saving programs on home computers in those days. And it lets you have up to eight players at the same time, or some kind of mix of yes. humans and AI? That's pretty ambitious. Uh, yes. Obviously, you have to all share the same computer, so you have to take it, take it in turns at the computer to um, play the game. But yes, it did work. So I saw a comment you were talking about AI, uh, this is an earlier an earlier interview. I'm not sure. I didn't write down the year. Uh, but you said at, so, at some point you really thought that the future was going to be AI, better and better AI. Yeah. Uh, but that you said that turned out to be to be wrong, that people got yeah. more interested in graphics than yeah. the AI. But this is something I've thought a lot about, too. I wish that we had the same level of progress in AI as we've seen in graphics. Yeah. Yeah, true. I mean... It's. Uh, I think we will probably get there. Um, although the interest still seems to be quite focused in, in graphics at the moment, with the um, uh, with the introduction of you know these new VR headsets and this idea of total immersion. But yeah, if you want to interact with something intelligent uh, that's not another human being, you're going to need some decent AI. And uh, yeah, it's still very lacking in most games, to be honest. I was listening to the news a while ago, and they were talking. I guess they've got a computer that beats the world champion at Go. Yeah, which is fantastic. That's pretty. That's, that's, just, that's the kind of stuff that gets me more excited than the Oculus Rift and all this kind of. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, Demis Sasabis, who was in charge of that project, um, used to be a game developer, um, and um, he left the games industry. Um, but he used to work with Peter Molyneux at Bullfrog Games many years ago. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so one last thing here about this uh, Lords of Ch Lords of Chaos yeah. in 1990. Apparently that wasn't the. I'm not sure how it did sales wise. It seemed like it wasn't wasn't a big big hit. Uh, that's more role playing oriented. Uh, so what, what what happened with that one? Why wasn't that? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, people who played it really liked it. Um, but we did have some problems with our publisher at the time. They were financially hard up, and I remember talking to a distributor at one computer show, and he says, he said to me, "Look, you know what happened to Laws of Chaos? We we ordered copies of it, but we didn't get any." And uh, you know, that's the first point where I thought, you know, uh oh, something is going wrong with our publisher here. Uh, so that was the last game that we did for that publisher. Um. And which is a shame, really, because I think the game was fundamentally sound and very good. Um, it really needed a disk drive to to play it, um, and it had a it had a sort of an RPG system where you could progress from one adventure to another, leveling up your wizard as you go. It was the demo for that was the Artari ST. We um, we actually made Lords of Chaos on five. Formats we on uh, Spectrum, Xenix Spectrum, Commodore 64, Anstrap CPC, Atari ST, and Commodore Amiga. So it was actually a very, very big and complex development for us at the time. 
Just out of curiosity, Julian, did you did you have a favorite con or console or computer? Uh, well, that era? I, uh, well, yeah, ZX Spectrum <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Um, I did. I did like the Commodore sixty four because it had some really decent hardware um, features, especially in the sound chip. Oh, the SID. It was a pain to program, though. I mean, it was much more awkward. Um, it, um, Atari ST was okay, but again, we moved very quickly past the ST and the Commodore Amiga onto the PC. And our first PC game was XCOM UFA Defense. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with parts two and maybe three of this interview series with Mr. Julian Gollop. And again, I apologize uh, for the missing video footage, but hopefully uh, what I put together was uh, decent at least. Uh, at any rate, I thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You, you have no idea. You know, when, sometimes when I just want to give up and quit, I think about all of you guys out there supporting the show and depending on me to put out another episode. And it gives me that motivation to get up and, and put these episodes together. So I uh, thank you each, uh, to each of you, one and all. And uh, remember, too, if you want to uh, support the show financially, uh, you can do that with PayPal or uh, uh, Patreon. Just go to the links in the show notes. Uh, but I also really appreciate it if you just tell your friends about the show, tweet about it, uh, put it on Facebook, whatever, you know, email your friends that like uh, video games, and I appreciate all of your support, so thank you once again. Okay, uh, what about that news for the Mac Cave? <laughs> All right, so I got a couple of pieces here from someone named Brock Wilbur uh, from Inverse Magazine. And the first one is that a new video game, an indie developer, came out, is coming out with a game called Haunted House Tycoon. So Haunted House Tycoon, right? And uh, they're being sued, uh, not by the tycoon people, but by Atari, who think that it infringes on their, apparently their rights uh, to the words Haunted House that they think uh, they own for all of video games because of their uh, haunted house game back in the day. Uh, so wacky stuff, you know, lawyers, right? Uh, but I'll post a link to that in the show notes if you want to read, read up on that. Uh, also, uh, Brock has written up a history of aliens, or the uh, alien movies and their history of video games I thought was interesting. Uh, I'd heard of most of these, but some were new to me. Uh, but I think you'll appreciate what Brock's put together. Apparently his favorite game is uh, Aliens Infestation for the Nintendo DS, and his least favorite is one called Aliens Colonial Marines. Uh, so it's pretty funny. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Aliens games yourself, but of course I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, I, I remember the one for the Commodore 64. Yeah, it was pretty primitive, I guess, but it uh, definitely scared me back in the day. Uh, and then finally, uh, Liz Stinson of Wired Magazine uh, has an article up about a uh, construction set, a game uh, design construction set called Infinite Arcade by Tiny Bob. And she says, uh, like pinball construction set, Infinite Arcade revolves around constructing worlds. And so there's a handful of templates there, pin pinball, pong, the runner games. And I think what's kind of cool about this is even though it's a sort of retro, uh, they, the graphics look a little different. Uh, so the way they described it here is, instead of hardcore pixel graphics, uh, they have implemented curves. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. I was uh, having some fun with it and thought I would uh, share it with you to see what you think. But uh, again, just go to the show notes and you can find links to all of those articles. All right, what about that drink of the week? Uh, this week I've got something really weird looking. I was <laughs> very intrigued by this. Uh, black water. Uh, BLK Premium Alkaline Water. Uh, and apparently the black color is not from food coloring or sewage, but, but rather uh, uh, naturally black by way of fulvic minerals. Fulvic? Fulvic minerals? Minerals. No idea what that 
is. I guess I could read this and find out. <laughs> so it organically extracted trace minerals. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Organically extracted. I guess that means uh, an organic being extracted them. Uh, minerals from deep beneath the earth's surface and combine them with uh, purify, purified water. Don't let the color scare you. This stuff is black for a reason. Uh, the naturally black trace minerals reacts with the pure water, which gives BOK its black color. Uh, anyway, yada yada. This is out of Oakland, New Jersey. Uh, I just thought it was kind of uh, kind of cool looking and I wanted to give it a try. So uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this BLK premium alkaline water here in the rather excellent drinking horn. So, you know, I've had some very watered down beers over the years, but never just pure water. So I've been smelling this and I'm not really smelling uh, any of these fulvic minerals. I guess they don't have much of an aroma. It just smells like water to me. Uh, but let's give it a taste. You can definitely taste uh, uh, some kind of mineral-like uh, qualities of this, kind of like a hard water. Uh, it tastes pretty good, you know, it's refreshing. Uh, I, d I definitely wouldn't mind drinking this uh, during a, a workout or whatever. Uh, however, there's not a lot of, uh, actually there's no flavor here at all. I was kind of hoping that those uh, fulvic minerals would have a bit of a taste, but really just, you know, it just tastes like water to me. Uh, so I guess the only thing cool about this really is the, the color. So if you want to freak everybody out by drinking some black water, uh, go for it. But otherwise, you know, what the hell, just drink some water from the tap. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to rate this. I don't really know how to rate water. Uh, but I guess as far as water goes, it's uh, quite wet. So <laughs> anyway, BLK uh, Premium Alkaline Water. Uh, pretty cool, but nothing really special in terms of taste anyway. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations about chaos. And I found one from uh, Steve Martin, uh, the comedian. It goes something like this. Chaos in the midst of chaos isn't funny. But chaos in the midst of order is. I think that's a pretty insightful uh, observation there. See you guys next week. Yes, yeah, so during the night, old Turkey has got his leg bitten sort of off.